Hello and welcome to Reporters Direct, an exclusive feature for subscribers of The Print. Uh, I'm Vandana Menon. Uh, I'm currently here on the ground in Sri Lanka, trying to cover the economic and political crisis. Um, and I'm here to take any questions uh, that our subscribers might have about the situation here on the ground. Uh, we actually have a couple of questions that have already come in, um, and I can start by answering some of them. Uh, Abhiji Salkar asks, are common citizens of Sri Lanka aware of the root causes which has resulted in the current situation, and what do they see as a solution? Thank you for your question, Abhiji. Um, I would say yes, common citizens of Sri Lanka are aware um, of why the situation has arisen, though I would say that there are several root causes for it. I think it was a buildup of um, one bad decision after another and all leading and all happening right after the pandemic when um, Sri Lanka's tourism sector was already affected. Um, so I think it's a buildup of all of these things. And right now, the main thing on the ground, more than um, understanding why they're in the situation is just anger for being in the situation. Um, so when I've been, I was, I've been on the streets for the last couple of days, um, protests have been continuing. Um, Monday especially was a huge, there were, there were huge, huge, huge crowds on the street. Uh, it was largely middle-class folks who were on the roads um, protesting and people who were, people who were just so angry about the way that, the way that they're being forced to live right now. Power cuts are long. Um, there's a daily timetable uh, in which we, in which um, the government has said we'll cut power from this from this hour to this hour, but it's not consistent um, and it's also updated regularly. So people have no idea. They just have to hope for the best. There are really long queues. In fact, um, I, I'm a three wheel driver, a tuk tuk driver here, an auto driver here was um, telling me a joke the other day that now in Colombo on one street, either side of the street uh, is lined with cars waiting for um, queuing up. For pet at petrol stations and it's only in the middle through which um, vehicles can go so that's kind of the situation here and i would say more than the trying to think about the cause of why people are here people are angry that they're in this position but back to some of the questions from our subscribers um, our subscriber vijay ratna asks do you think sri lanka will emerge successfully out of this crisis wow that's that's a big question um, i definitely hope so um, I think the government, so there's a lot of, yes, there's a lot of confusion about what's happening in parliament and what's happening with policymakers. Um, President Gorbaya Rajpaksa seems clear that he doesn't want, he doesn't seem like he's going to step down. And he's clear that an IMF um, bailout is what will help the country. And he's sure that that will come in a couple of months. I mean, this is what sources on the ground are saying, and this is part of what, um, uh, parliamentary discussion. This was part of Parliament's discussion yesterday. Um, or rather, or rather, his supporters are sure that I'm, that um, an, a loan will come. However, the IMF is known to um, only give uh, loans to countries with a target-oriented plan that they usually follow, um, and also tends to give loans to countries that are able to prove political stability. Um, right now, Sri Lanka is not able to do that. So we'll have to wait and see how things happen. Um, the economic crisis has essentially triggered a political crisis um, where parliament is in complete turmoil. Um, the president's party, the SLPP, the Rajapaksa's party, the SLPP lost their majority two days ago. Um, so right now there's, it's, there's no opposition. Um, <laughs> the cabinet has resigned. Um, so, there's, so there's complete chaos. However, a new chairman has been appointed to the central bank. Um, who uh, people seem to be um, happy about and hopeful about. So um, I think, I mean, we'll have to wait and see. Things in Sri Lanka are so difficult that it feels like there's nowhere from here but up, but um, let's wait and see. Um, we have another question uh, from our subscriber, Gopal Krishna Pillai. Why did this come as a surprise for the Sri Lankan citizens? The warning signs were out there over the last 18 months. I mean, this is exactly the same question I have. Um, I just, it's being here, it's just unbelievable that, you know, um, it feels like this was allowed to happen. Um, but it, but like I said, it was one crisis, like I said earlier, it was one crisis after another, which just kept building and building and building. And there were several um, badly thought out policy decisions that were made that were 
that were supposed aimed to be short term fixes they and ended up creating this long term crisis so for example some of the policies i'm talking about are um there were tax cuts um last year which Im which immediately cut the amount of money that the government was getting um there was um a move to organic farming which was disastrous um which was almost an overnight um which was almost an overnight move by president gorbachev rajpaksa um that the the yes it was it it's for the benefit of the of the citizens but it's something that takes time to happen and it wasn't implemented properly and um some sources say that part of the reason why he decided to make that move was because fertilizers were expensive and i think sri lanka was spending about 400 million dollars on fertilizers so that so there are several reasons like that um as to how this happened but i think more than surprise like i said is anger and that and people have no other way of expressing it than coming out on the streets also like in i'm here in colombo which is you know urban it's, and um here there's it's mostly the middle class who are out on the streets which is not some they're not typically the first set of people that you usually see protesting um but now people are affected by these long power cuts they are affected by shortages in um food fuel um paper medicines all of these things are in short supply so it's, it, it is affecting the average sri lankan um and nobody is unaffected by this which is why um there's such um anger that's out there we have another question uh from shekhar narayanan um can an economic crisis of this magnitude happen overnight what were the so called economists in the finance ministry in sri lanka doing um i feel like we sort of went over this it doesn't happen overnight and um i think and this is my personal observation uh i think it's a, it's a bit of a democratic shake up for the government because they've never seen anything like this happen either it feels like a mini arab spring the protests are completely organic all of them are grassroots and they're completely people driven so it's all happening very organically on the streets um and i don't think anybody really expect nobody in the government whether in the sdpp or in the opposition the sgp it's an alliance um i don't think anybody saw this coming so uh there's a, there's a different sense of accountability that's happening now um where people feel like okay yes they are elected representatives and they need to and they need to take a stance which is why the government the the finance ministry has had a shake up economists are doing this people within the within the government are stepping aside this is exactly why that's happening so 42 mps from the slpp decided to go independent um which is which is a which is a difficult decision to make so the, but that's how but that's that's how fractured the government is and that's how fractured um the ruling party is so there's basically no government in place and there's almost no strong opposition in place either uh we have one from rangnathan dev is the corruption levels in sri lanka any higher than a uh, typical south asian and less developed countries is that contributing to the economic co collapse i would say uh i would say yes that that i not any higher than other countries but there is definitely corruption um uh and it and i and yes i think it does contribute and in most cases corruption would contribute to the economic collapse there's something that's not going right some of the numbers aren't adding up sri lanka has a lot of foreign investment coming in has a lot of um uh, has a lot of uh, infrastructural projects that are being built here funded by countries like china but it's also extremely um debt ridden and that's really the issue so clearly the money that's coming in or the money that they're making by the from the major exports and from the tourism industry isn't 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 bridging the gap where the money disappeared is anybody's answer i guess we have several questions about china, chinese financial assistance um look china invests in infrastructure projects so there's a sense of yes there is a sense of debt and indebtedness that that indebtedness that happens there because china can very easily um pull out of the projects um but i think in a country uh, like sri lanka it um this is this is the route that the government decided to go down um but on if if it if that's okay i also wanted to talk about um some of my experiences uh, reporting so one of the things that has blown me away is 
just the kind of unity that people have and this and when and perhaps this is part of um, our bias as we enter the field or um, I mean, I'm very aware that I'm coming in from a completely different context, but I, when I think about Sri Lanka, um, I do think about the ethnic conflicts between the Tamils and the Sinhalese, and I do think about how this is a, this is a, this is a very, this is a divided island. But right now, on the ground, it doesn't seem like that at all. Minorities are standing, you know, shoulder to shoulder with, um, with the majority, and and there seems to be a communal sense of togetherness here that we're all in this together, and that's really, um, I mean, it's heartening to see. It's it is sad because. It is sad, of course, but it's very heartening to see this kind of unity. And I think it's and I think and it's almost entirely organically youth driven as well. And that's been really nice. And it's it's even if even if it's just people standing outside with placards, people driving by will support them. Um, auto drivers will stop and support them. And um, sometimes um, uh, on Monday, there was this huge protest at um, a roundabout called Nelam Pokana. And um, it was jam packed with protesters. Um, cars were not able to get through. Um, but, surpri and, but surprisingly, people were getting out of their cars to join the protest and um, were not upset about being held up. It was, they were they were also buying into the energy. There was traffic police present, but traffic police were, you know, um, kind of not intervening. So that was really nice to see. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it I went, as part of my reporting, I went to visit certain areas um, where there is deep pockets of urban poverty. And, that, and there the situation is slightly different because these are people who are used to um, power cards are used to not being heard or having their rights protected. Um, so there, there's a sense of, there is a sense of anger, but these are, but these are people who don't, who can't step out of their homes or can't step away from work to protest. So I went to one area, um, yesterday called Orugodavate, which is, um, um, a mix of several different communities. There are Sinhala Buddhist people, Sinhala Christian people, Tamil people, Muslim people. Um, and it's also a different mix of incomes, but largely low income. Um, and when I was there, I uh, I met this, we, I was speaking to a lot of the, uh, workers who were working, who, who people were living there, but they were also small, tiny, like there was one tailor shop that I visited, for example, where five women were working. And they told me categorically that, look, um, the choice is between the choices between queuing up for essentials or going to work and making money. So if they choose, if they, if they don't go to work, they will lose their daily salary, their daily wage, but they have to make that choice to buy essentials. And they were telling all of them are mothers and they were telling me that they can't feed their children, um, they don't have anything special to feed their children with. And most days they make some rice, one vegetable preparation and dry fish. They can't afford chicken. They can't afford eggs. They can't afford more seafood. Um, sugar is really expensive. Milk powder is really expensive. Milk powder is something that Sri Lankans actually have quite a lot. Um, milk is, sugar is prohibitively expensive. So these are the issues um, that people have, um, especially lower income people. They prefer to go stand in line at ration shops and government shops because that's obviously cheaper. Um, but the queues are much, much, much longer. So it's really it's it's it it was really rough to see that that choice being made where you have to do this. We have um, a couple more questions from GK Pillai. Do we see a positive fallout for India and Sri Lanka relations as a result of the crisis, or will our support for the present backfire, for the present president backfire if the crisis prolongs? Um, I think there's an enormous sense of gratitude on the streets for the help that is coming in. That I can say categorically. Um, there is a sense uh, it, it it's it's not the overwhelming, it's not the overarching feeling. There is also the sense of why do we have to be in a position where we have to receive foreign aid? But whenever I introduce myself as Indian, um, uh, people not not I mean. There are plenty of people who come back and say yes india has given necessary aid that is required and people and and i've also noticed that there is a gen that there is an awareness of how much money is coming in from different countries so people are keeping tabs of that um i think i think india and sri lanka have 
anyway had a have had a good relationship um there's there's a long historical tie and um india has also invested in several um welfare state um um initiatives in sri lanka which goes a long way so um i think that there is a sense of gratitude i don't i think it's more for the people than for the president really the help that is coming in um so that's that's my personal opinion uh we have another question from an anonymous attendee is anyone in sri lanka benefiting from the situation are people with large foreign assets using foreign currency to buy up local assets hoping that the situation will eventually resolve i hope the situation will resolve as well um yes the rich are getting richer um and uh i don't know about buying up local assets thank you that's something that i should look into um but i would say that the rich are getting richer i'm also working on a piece on how um the wealthy are uh, weathering this crisis and to be honest um tourism is still happening there are still groups of indian tourists coming in groups of other uh, different tourists who are coming in during this crisis for example casinos have stayed open 24 hours um to cater to their clientele um so that is it it does feel a little bit surreal that this is happening um and also i ran into a sri lankan couple um here at the hotel that i'm staying at and they told me that they've come to stay in a hotel because they don't want they don't want to they want to avoid power cuts and they 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 renovating their kitchen so in a in a sense life still continues as normal for those who can afford it um but i wouldn't say anybody is really maybe benefiting is the wrong word there are people who are affected by it more than other people um that's how i would say it but thank you for pointing that out i should look into um how people with large foreign assets using foreign currency are dealing um with the crisis and whether they're buying local assets uh we have another question um from ranganathan b any lessons india should imbibe from the sri lankan government especially in the economic side given the underlying weakness in our economy with huge debt and rising inflation well the main i think the major lesson is to have foresight and to not let this happen and to not take the people's support for granted i think i think that's the biggest thing because let's not forget prasen godavai rajapaksa was voted in with a huge majority he's a first time politician he's a first time president um but he was immensely popular and people had a lot of hopes for him um i'll give you a quick background about the rajapaksa family if you're not um sure uh, but essentially uh, it's a group it's the three brothers um mahinda rajapaksha was the former um president he's now prime minister and um he was the guy who kind of um led sri lanka uh, and he was one who ended the civil war so he was extremely popular uh, his brother godabaya is now the president who um is a first time politician and the third brother is basil rajapaksha who is um who was the finance minister so the rajapaksas are in the slpp party and uh, they won in a huge landslide in 2020 um and appointed several um of their family members into um politics so that is that is a very that is dynastic politics in sri lanka as well there are a couple of um politically strong and politically active families who are in parliament um uh so yeah so this is what happened with the rajapaksas and then another thing that um i think people uh, are really upset about is uh, uh, the 20th amendment which is an amendment that president godavai rajapaksa introduced uh that essentially gives him sweeping executive powers so that that is what gives him the mandate to take decisions like introducing organic farming overnight or to deploy um forces overnight that's what without any major checks and balances um so this is part of the uh, issue that's happening here um yeah and and be and i've also noticed a, a like i've also noticed political awareness amongst the people which is um something that's uh, that i thought is interesting to see you can ask anybody on the street and they will have it and they will have an explanation for and it's usually quite astute so there's a people are people are translating their lived reality in and they have nowhere else to place the blame except at the government's feet um so that's what's happening i think it's a very organic sort of um democratic moment right now in sri lanka like a mini arab spring where they where most people have completely lost faith in um the government's ability so really uh, we have to wait and see um how the situation here pans out but uh, also on an on another note i plan on traveling sri lanka is uh, 
I'm, I plan on traveling across the country as well to sort of um, visit uh, different pockets of this of the country and see how people are dealing with uh, dealing with the situation, especially the rural poor who have a very different um, uh, a very different experience than the urban poor. One thing to note is that urban poverty in Sri Lanka doesn't look like urban poverty in India. Sri Lanka is a country that has um, good social indicators, high rates of literacy, high life expectancy. The poverty rates are technically quite low, um, and uh, it you know if a, a slum or a shanty uh, area in in Sri Lanka in Colombo doesn't look like a slum in Mumbai or Delhi. The houses are more pakka. Um, yes, roads are not paved, but this is something that people are upset about. And it there is there is slightly more um, I guess wealth that is that that the urban poor have. Um, and some people will be able to speak English. Um, nearly everybody can read and write. So um, urban poverty does look a little different, but rural poverty is something that I am yet to track, and I'm um, curious to go see how people in um, tea plantations, especially um, Tamil people who uh, are poor and third generation Indian Tamils who've been working as pickers, tea pickers um, for decades, how they are dealing with the situation because they've anyway been used to, um, let's not forget Sri Lanka had a long civil war and the north and the east, which is where the Tamil populations are, have already been ex have been experiencing power cuts um, way longer than um, uh, urban areas like Colombo. Uh, and at different points in time as Sri Lanka has progressed. So in the last, in the last, uh, so, that, so like I was saying, there's a completely different um, dimension to this. And also uh, another thing I've noticed is that the pe young people who are protesting today are the people who came of age after the war ended. Um, and so there's a different relationship that they have with the state, whereas a lot of older people still remember the crackdown of the civil war, what that was like, um, and the kind of police brutality that happened, for example. So it's that's why I think there's a different sense of um, freedom with which younger people are using social media and younger people are shouting their slogans. And the slogans, personally, I mean, I mean, the slogans are quite um, strong. So. Many of them accuse Gotabaya of being a thief. Um, so it's Gota Hore, Hore is Sinhala for thief. Um, they also call Gota uh, Pisa. Pisa is Sinhala slang for, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's apparently extremely disrespectful and it's slang for someone who's like a madman, someone that you have no respect for, um, someone whose actions can't be explained. And that's something that they're screaming on the streets. Um, people are also saying, you know, resignation is not equal to reassignment. So they're seeing through um, the kind of uh, optics, optic management that the government is trying to do to manage the situation. Uh, we have another question from um, uh, Sid Pate. The Sri Lankan economic collapse only reached headlines recently. What was the biggest trigger for the protest? Ah, um, the biggest. So the biggest trigger was on Thursday evening, last Thursday exactly ago, um, when uh, protesters gathered outside uh, Raj Baksha's house, and and uh, violence was used. So tear gas and water cannons were used against them, and this is when the situation kind of. Um, kind of worsened. The next day, Friday, state of emergency was in, was enforced. And then a surprise curfew was announced on Saturday afternoon, which went into effect at 6 p.m. on Saturday and stayed until Monday. So there are these panic measures that are being implemented. The emergency has been lifted now. Um, but uh, uh, I would say the biggest trigger for the protest is just anger, right? Like um, they don't, people don't have electricity for, um, 10, 12 hours a day, at least a minimum of eight hours a day. That's the thing that they don't have electricity for. And the people who um, uh, whose work work is affected by it have nothing to do but be out or, or, or have this the time and the space to be to feel the anger of it. So I would say that that's what it is. It's when you're it's when you yourself are affected by a power cuts by not you're not able to if the restaurants are closed. Um, uh, you know, so it's 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 a very it's people are not not aren't living the life that they have known, and I think it's got to a point where they don't want to do that anymore. So that's that's really what um, I would say was the trigger. 
but yes, think it reached the headlines on Thursday because that's when things took a turn for the worse. And that's that's when I personally would pinpoint um, when the economic crisis turned into a political crisis, which changes the dimension um, of what's happening here. Um, I think we're running out of time uh, and I've also got to get back to um, filing um, ground reports uh thanks which is made possible by um you are subscribers so thank you so much for subscribing to the print and um please subscribe to our youtube channel and click on the join button on our youtube homepage to be become a member of the print community um thank you so much for your time and um thank you for supporting us